Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the second plenary session of the SDG 16 conference, where we will be discussing lessons learned from the pandemic. For those who have just joined us, uh, I'm Jan Beagle, the Director General of the International Development Law Organization, and I'll be moderating this discussion. As we all know, COVID-19 has exploited the fragility and inequalities to which no country, irrespective of stage of development, is wholly immune. It has exposed the consequence of decades of underinvestment and neglect in core governance and institutional capacities, as countries across the world have struggled to respond effectively. In many ways, the pandemic is a wake-up call. It has revealed, in the clearest terms possible, that unless we act to tackle the inequality, insecurity, and injustice that are at the core of this fragility, our societies will continue to be vulnerable to shocks and crises and our common future insecure. At the same time, there are many lessons to be learned. The crisis has forced us to innovate, experiment, and adapt. Many good practices have emerged at local, national, regional, and international levels. The key principles of SDG 16, such as transparency, accountability, participation, and engagement, remain central to strengthen the capacity of communities to withstand shocks and recover. There is tremendous scope for us to learn from experiences and expertise across the world and to use this knowledge as a catalyst to promote fairer and more resilient models of governance and development. I am joined by a panel of senior policymakers and experts on the front lines of the crisis response who will share their insights on how we can tackle inequality, reduce fragilities, and put ourselves on the path of a more just, peaceful and sustainable future. I'm very pleased to introduce them. Firstly, Ms. Hannah Tete, Under Secretary General and Special Representative of the Secretary General to the African Union and Head of the United Nations Office to the AU. Ms. Annika Ben David, Ambassador at Large for Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Sweden. Ms. Miroslav Jensha, Assistant Secretary General for Europe, Central Asia and the Americas in the United Nations Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations. Mr. Maximo Torero Cullen, Chief Economist at FAO. Ms. Asako Okai, Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Crisis Bureau of UNDP. Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, Special Rapporteur of the United Nations Human Rights Council and the General Assembly on the independence of judges and lawyers. And Ms. Lynn Rose Jane Genon of the Executive Council of Young Women Plus for Peace and Leadership of the Philippines. Welcome to everyone. Let me turn to our first speaker, Ms. Hannah Tete. Hannah, as a lawyer, member of parliament and minister in Ghana, and now as the Secretary General Special Representative to the African Union, you have deep experience in issues related to institutional capacity, resilience, and the protection of vulnerable groups. What lessons can we draw from the African response to COVID-19? What are some of the effective approaches to strengthening governance responses in crisis situations? And how can the protection of vulnerable groups be prioritized? You have the floor. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you for the invitation. Good morning, good afternoon. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and co-panelists. The impact of the COVID pandemic on the African continent was severe. And it was severe because we already suffered from weak health systems and with varying levels of institutional capacity. And just to give you an indication of the kind of challenges that um, we were facing, and I want to use my own country, Ghana, as an example, because then I like The Global Health Observatory data for 2019, using the population of Ghana using at least basic sanitation services, were 18.47% of the population. And that reflects to on people who are um, places where they actually had access to sanitary services in their homes. On the other hand, the country scored 73% in terms of the average of 13 international health capacity core regulation scores. And just those numbers give an indication of the kind of inequality that exists within a country like mine, but in many other African countries as well. 
We also had the challenge of having countries where the informal economy was very large, the formal economy was very small. The ILO estimates that in Sub-Saharan Africa, over 65% of total employment is in the informal sector. And for that reason, there isn't really the capacity to provide the social safety nets to cushion the impact of an inability of an individual to earn income on a sustained basis. So at the outbreak of the pandemic, when we had the lockdowns, initially that was the response and some of the lockdowns were quite draconian. But because of the presence of this large informal sector, it was very clear that they could not be sustained. And so there was a mixed response of within the formal public sector, within the formal private sector, people began to use digital tools to be able to uh, work. And in the informal sector, there were large public relations campaigns explaining what the symptoms of the um, virus were, how people could protect themselves. But all of this done against the backdrop of weak structures. And so it's in that regard that I think that the African Union's response has indeed been an example of what can be done where they agreed that there is strength in numbers. As early as February 2020, the African Union brought together to create a proactive and unified response with the adoption of the Africa Joint Continental Strategy for COVID-19. And so we saw that immediately there was a uniformity of understanding of the challenge and the kind of things that needed to be done to respond. The Africa CDC, the Africa Center for Disease Control, launched the Africa Task Force for Coronavirus to coordinate surveillance, infection prevention, and control in healthcare facilities, clinical management of infected individuals, laboratory diagnosis, risk communication, and community engagement. Then they went further to develop the partnership to accelerate COVID-19 testing in order to support pool procurement, storage, and distribution of diagnostics and other medical supplies. A special envoy was appointed to mobilize the private sector response to launch the Africa Medical Supplies Platform in partnership with Afriexim Bank, UNECA, and other leading African institutions and foundations to unlock access to an African and global base of vetted manufacturers and procurement partners to enable the continent to purchase certified medical equipment, diagnostic kits, PPE, etc. And they have also started the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Team working with the Africa Medical Supplies Platform to commence the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines by providing an advance procurement commitment of up to $2 billion in January. And there has also been the establishment of the AU COVID Response Fund to support member states. And so you see that by having a continental response and using that to inform a national response, what we saw was that within member states, there was clear guidance as to what could be done. Now, of course, there was a difference in capacities and their abilities to be able to implement all of these best practices that were agreed on through this strategy that was developed and even to access PPE and supplies. But we move from a situation of having six labs at the beginning of the pandemic that were able to test for COVID to now having most member states having the capacity to test for COVID. But in terms of SDG 16, peace, security, strong institutions, that is where we saw some of the gaps. Last year in Africa, there were 20 elections. And of those 20 elections, one was postponed and it's going to take place this year, but most of them, and these were both presidential and legislative elections, but most of them went on, albeit with some form of um, implementation of the rules, the guidelines to prevent the further spread of COVID with mixed results. We also saw increased high handedness and in some cases, a crackdown on the opposition using the excuse of, as it were, the COVID response and therefore limiting the ability to have access to the public space and to be able to campaign. But then you also saw examples of countries where in spite of all of these restrictions, there was an effort to be able to have what would be called competitive elections. So on a continent with 54 countries recognized by the UN, 55 by the African Union, there's always going to be a diversity and a huge range of variables between what was done and what responses were provided. The difficulty was in the providing social protection and social safety nets. And this has to do with the economic strength of the various member states. 
Indeed, I just said at the beginning of my presentation, over 65% of the population operate within their informal sector. Most African countries' major source of revenue is their commodity exports. There was a significant drop in commodity prices and therefore the ability to be able to provide an effective financial response. And so going forward, the question has to be, in order to be able to create greater equity and to make sure that the world comes out of this together, what tools do we have within the multilateral system to be able to support those countries that do not have the capacity to be able to provide responses that adequately protect the most vulnerable in society at a time of pandemic, to make sure that we get out of this together we do not see, as we have seen recently in India, the development of new strains of the virus simply because of the lack of control of the spread that ultimately are going to affect all of us. And with regard to, finally, the last point I'd like to make, with regard to the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, well, that had mixed results. In some parts of the continent where we have had significant um, violence and conflict, in the Central African Republic, where there was also an election, we can't say that things have improved for the better. Neither is that the case in Somalia. But in Libya, we have made significant progress. And we see the beginnings tentatively of a return to a governance system that has the mandate and the will of the people of Libya through um, elections, which we hope will be organized sometime at the end of the year. And at the same time, having a government that is more inclusive of different factions. So I'll end here by saying that we've had a mixed bag. We have had a strong institutional response through the African Union to deal with the pandemic per se, but we still have issues as far as the peace and security challenges are concerned. And those are matters on which we will need to have as much multilateral engagement as possible between international organizations, multilateral organizations like the United Nations, regional and sub-regional organizations to make an impact and to make sure that the most vulnerable are not going to be seen to continue to suffer long after the developed world has gotten over COVID and has begun to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving us that perspective um, from the African continent. I'm pleased now to welcome Ambassador Anika Ben David, Sweden's ambassador at large for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So Ambassador, 2021 marks the 100th year since the adoption of universal suffrage in Sweden, and your government has been promoting a major drive for democracy. Why is this a priority as countries seek to recover and rebuild after the pandemic? Thank you very much, Director General, dear participants, dear co-panelists. I'm honored to speak on behalf of the government of Sweden at this important uh, venue. Uh, and indeed, Madam Director General, we are marking an important year in Sweden uh, 2021. It's the 100th anniversary, as you said, of universal suffrage. And uh, I think equality and gender equality in particular is something that is absolutely necessary for peaceful, just and inclusive societies. Without it, we will not achieve sustainable development. And this is why Sweden has a feminist government, the first of its kind in the world, and a feminist foreign policy since several years. We, we are convinced that democracy is the best foundation for a sustainable, peaceful and inclusive society. Research demonstrates that democratic and equal societies provide opportunities for each and every one to achieve their full potential and participate in the, in the development of society in a way that other systems of government cannot do. Democratic societies provide uh, rule of law and human rights for all and SDG 16 provides an opportunity for us to reach this as an enabler for the entire 2030 agenda. As we have heard in the previous session, and as we're all very much aware, uh, the world is facing perhaps the greatest challenge of our time. Uh, the pandemic has exposed weaknesses, as we heard from Madam Tete, before uh, in our public institutions and systems, not least uh, in healthcare. And while this shows that SDG 16 is more important than ever, it has also put us 
further behind the realization of this goal and it has exacerbated our common challenges. Um, even before the pandemic struck, the multilateral system, the rules-based world order and democratic principles were being put into question. Respect for human rights and the rule of law was on the decline and democratic institutions were being weakened. And this trend has been further compound, compounded by the pandemic. It has accelerated uh, the decline of democracy worldwide. So against this uh, backdrop of, of negative global trends on democracy, Sweden launched in 2019 uh, a Drive for Democracy, a foreign policy initiative that mobilizes our entire foreign service, our three ministers and our 100 plus foreign missions. It is reflected in all areas of our foreign policy. It involves providing support and sustenance wherever democracy can grow and expressing criticism when democracy is eroded. We have, uh, among other things, increased our democracy support and we will stand up for democracy's defenders and institutions. Now, translating the drive for democracy, this foreign policy initiative into the context of the pandemic means that we must ensure that actions to combat the pandemic don't undermine or disregard democratic institutions and processes. In our view, the response must have gender equality, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law at its core. Let me please, Madam Director General, go into four areas that we believe are crucial in our efforts to build back better. First, accountability. Some states use the current situation as a pretext or an excuse to restrict human rights, such as the freedom of movement, freedom of expression or privacy. We must be vigilant and prevent the pandemic from, from becoming a breeding ground for governmental overreach. Therefore, it's crucial that we, together, make sure that there will be accountability for any human rights violations or abuses during this crisis as well as for any undermining of democratic principles or the rule of law. We must ensure that emergency actions and law, laws are only temporary and that when they are being issued are in line with international law and the rule of law. Checks and balances must be ensured between the legislative, executive and judicial powers. In this respect, we appreciate the rule of law based approach to the pandemic presented by ILO. Second, institution building. To strengthen the capacity, accountability, transparency and effectiveness of public institutions in line with SDG 16 is absolutely key. This has been further made clear by the pandemic and the challenges faced when addressing it. Strong democratic institutions are necessary when recovering and rebuilding from the pandemic, as well as for addressing future crises. Building institutional capacity must be addressed, must also be addressed through a human rights-based approach. Third, ensuring a free and independent media. We have witnessed the negative impact that measures to combat the COVID-19 virus has had on civil society and free and independent media. We also know that restrictions on media, on free media, is one of the first signs of democratic backsliding. Ensuring the right to freedom of expression, information and information online as well as offline is crucial. Free and independent media play a critical role in ensuring individuals that our individuals are well informed and able to participate meaningfully in democratic processes as well as to counter disinformation. They also contribute to hold those in power accountable. And fourth, bridging the digital divides. We must ensure that no one is left behind when rebuilding after the pandemic. The digital divides, including not least the gender digital divide, have been clearly exposed during the pandemic when large parts of the world have gone through a digital transformation. 
access to open, free and secure digital technologies have enabled us to continue our lives, our work and our economies. They are important platforms for communication, for the enjoyment of human rights, for democratic engagement, access to information and to government services such as healthcare. But we know everyone has not been included. This is concerning and something to be aware of when we go into a post-pandemic situation. Bridging the digital divides is a key aspect of fulfilling SDG 16 and building back better. To conclude, in the current context, we have seen that our drive for democracy is as relevant as ever. Because democracy can never be taken for granted, it's worth protecting every day, and we hope that you will join us, you all, as international cooperation is key to build back better and deliver on SDG 16 through a human rights based approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ben David. I'm now turning to Mr. Marislav Jencha, Assistant Secretary General for Europe, Central Asia and the Americas in the United Nations Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations. Marislav, the UN's approach to sustain peace highlights the importance of addressing root causes of conflict, which are often related to broader global challenges, such as climate change, extreme inequality and transnational crime. How has COVID-19 affected existing conflict dynamics and what lessons can we draw in the recovery phase to build more resilient and peaceful societies? Over to you. Thank you, Director General. Uh, thank you, dear John. And uh, I am really grateful for uh, inviting the UN Department uh, of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs to this uh, conference. And as you mentioned in your introductory remarks, uh, this session in particular is very close to the focus of the work of the BPPA and in line with our goal to create more resilient societies that can manage conflicts in non-violent manners through inclusive political processes and political institutions. The peace and security environment we face today is likely to deteriorate uh, around several trends uh, in the coming years. Violent conflicts have become more fragmented with many more armed non-state actors and regional actors, which are harder to resolve, calling into question the effectiveness of traditional conflict management and resolution tools, including peace operations and mediation efforts. Climate emergency has exacerbated the risks and created additional sources of stress. Technological disruption that uh, has been mentioned today several uh, times is shaping politics and conflicts across the world. Inequalities as important risk factor for violent conflicts uh, are increasing, including as a result of COVID-19. At the same time, a renewed global and regional strategic competition has made multilateral cooperation more difficult when it is needed the most. While these trends have been evident for some time, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated many, adding stress both at the national level and within the multinational system. By disrupting the lives and economies, challenging community relations and undermining trust in the national and also international institutions, the pandemic has created uh, new flashpoints for tension and increased the risks of uh, instability. Women and girls especially have already been disproportionately affected by the deteriorating peace, security, health, uh, social, economic, and uh, human rights environment, including with the unprecedented spike in domestic and gender-based violence during the pandemic. The pandemic has also made more evident the devastating impact of disinformation and hate speech and the manipulation of information for political purposes at both the international and national levels. 
the convergence of these risks coupled with the longer term uh, ripple effects of the pandemic will create needs that unquestionably outpace the ability to respond. We think that the real, the only real sustainable solution is prevention. It is only prevention that can help us, if I may uh, use uh, the terminology, flatten the curve of conflict and create space uh, for our conflict management tools not to be overwhelmed. Financing is of course key in this regard. Uh, and uh, as we still struggle to fundraise in a sustainable way, in 2018, only 4% of uh, official development uh, aid uh, was spent on prevention and 13% on peace building. Our, our prevention capacities cannot meet existing demand, let alone a prevention challenge magnified by the threats we identified in today's uh, discussion. The need to invest in prevention goes beyond additional funding. It requires expanding our analytical lens so that the concept and practice of prevention can address multidimensional risks beyond the peace and security realm. As the sustaining peace resolutions uh, of uh, 2016 emphasize, peace building and sustaining peace is the responsibility of the entire UN system. The development actors are particularly important. Inequality, poverty, and discrimination often occur in the context of weak governance, security, and justice institutions that fail to ensure equitable resource sharing. This problem lies at the root of most political instability and violent conflict. Consequently, the prevention approach goes beyond SDG 16 and cuts across the 2030 agenda. In terms of successful prevention, the pandemic showed us that there is a need to work more closely with national actors, engaging earlier, listening to them upstream and operationally to address emerging threats uh, and use our tools flexibly. We can also move towards switching the narrative from one of prevention intervention to building resilience, strengthening social cohesion, and promoting more peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. We have made considerable progress in the recent years uh, in this context. Um, I will uh, mention just uh, a few points uh, in order to save time, including creating a dedicated mechanism to address the security implications of climate change across our world, making a concerted investment in innovation within the department, putting the women peace and security and the youth uh, peace and security agendas at the center of our work and further strengthening the joint UNDP-DPPA program on conflict uh, prevention, which deploys peace and development advisors in 65 countries to play a critical role in accompanying, connecting, and empowering national actors to lead peace efforts. They role bridging the gap between peace and development and ensuring that such efforts are inclusive and sustainable was particularly political in the COVID-19 response. To conclude, uh, the foundations for real impactful work on prevention have been laid out. We now need to do the hard work to build on them, to recover better and to minimize the impact of shocks such as pandemic, as the pandemic, especially on already fragile situations, we need more investment in the sustainable development goals and we need to do that through effective collective uh, efforts. As COVID-19 has demonstrated, global solutions and global solidarity are in the interest of everyone. We need to listen to and work with partners in the countries, in the regions, 
in order to make progress in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Maximo Torero, the Chief Economist uh, at the FAO. Uh, Mr. Torero, in the wake of lockdowns and public health restrictions uh, adopted to tackle COVID-19 last year, the United Nations called for urgent action to prevent a food crisis. What role can effective laws, policies and institutions play in strengthening food systems and making them more resilient to crises like COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, in only 13 months, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has profoundly changed our world. Unlike previous crises, it affected all countries across the world, provoking the global economic recession and impacting livelihoods, food security and nutrition of millions of producers, small and medium agribusinesses, market vendors, traders, and especially poor consumers. In India, 62% of the farm households reported disruptions to their diets. In Vermont, in USA, 33% of the households experienced food insecurity since COVID-19 started. Globally, the pandemic added between 83 up to 132 million people to become chronically hungry and increased the number of emergency hunger hotspots to 20 countries. We are also expecting an additional 6.7 million malnourished children. The problem today is a problem of access, access to food because of the economic recession. And we have to be prepared for that. In our latest numbers of the food insecurity experience scale, we see enormous increases in all regions of the world of the level of food insecurity. The pandemic and associated policy response exposed and exploited governance weaknesses and inequalities in the global food systems, globally and locally, including between and within countries and among vulnerable population groups. It is also revealed a strong interlinkages between governance, institutional capacities, and effectiveness of measures taken to respond to COVID-19 and prevent food crises. In some countries, lack of transparency about COVID-19 response measures, lack of awareness among possible beneficiaries, and wide administrative discretion opening the way to favoritism and discrimination led to failure of such measures to, to reach many of those in greatest need. Lack of real-time data on vulnerable groups and program performance have created confusion and diminished program efficiency and effectiveness. For example, in some cases, procedures established to access cash transfers resulted in leaving the poorest behind or the most affected by COVID-19, which not necessarily were the traditional people in the listings of these programs. In some countries, the development of multiple uncoordinated initiatives using a project approach compromised program effectiveness and efficiency, wasting already scarce government resources. There were also issues in global governance of food, a strong focus on metrics to the detriment of the political analysis, insufficient coordination and financing for preparedness and response to global shocks and the role of global food architecture. This meant that consistent with other crises, the pandemic hit the most vulnerable and marginalized the hardest, a clear reflection of inequalities in which we live. Those populations that already struggle with social and economic exclusion and inequalities lack of access to resources, inputs and capital, particularly refugees and displaced persons, workers engaged in collecting, processing and distributing food, indigenous peoples, women and rural youth employed in informal economy. We know that in the food systems, the jobs that were affected were jobs where more females were working. And therefore, again, another inequality effect of this pandemic. On the other hand, the large actors along supply chain chains, food retail companies and supermarket groups largely benefit from the pandemic through accelerated concentration. For example, the pandemic has resulted in an 8.1% drop in GDP in Latin America, the world's region with the highest income inequality, where the 10% of the population captures 54% of the average national income. This bleak picture could have been much worse without innovative measures and actions put in place by many national and local governments and support provided by development and humanitarian partners. In response to the pandemic, individual countries are innovating governance arrangements to respond to disruptions in food systems. This often bear on locally led interventions, coordinated and collective action of governmental and non-governmental actors, as well as technical and financial partners. In Kenya, a food security war room has been constituted at the Ministry of Agriculture to address all emergency issues related to food and nutrition security. It includes NGOs, development partners, farmer organizations, traders, and agricultural sector network. In Uganda, the National Farmers Federation called the establishment of a multi-stakeholder food and nutrition security task force to coordinate different aspects of food and nutrition security during the after COVID-19 pandemic. 
In many cases, cities and local governments took action. In Indoor City in Madhya Pradesh, the chief minister appointed a top team to deal with emergency, which decided to create a COVID-19 war room to ensure a cohesive and comprehensive response to the crisis with centralized decision-making and, con and connecting all core dimensions together. The municipality of Milan has developed the food aid systems to compensate for the restrictive measures against the spread of the virus by working together with the food policy office, the social policy departments, the civil protection, the food bank, private sector, and civil society organizations. In Dakar, our whole coordination groups with civil society, volunteer groups, NGOs, and neighborhood communities, religious institutions, charities, and private donors, national and local authorities have been set up. The mobilization of the private sector, both formal and informal, play a key role in Cape Town, informal food retailers have been instrumental in making food parcels available in block townships. Initiatives were taken at the regional and global level too. For example, the 35 countries of the Americas and the Caribbean created a forum for dialogue and cooperation around the actions to address COVID-19 impacts on food security and agriculture. The International Coordination Group on COVID-19 was established to keep transportation links and supply chains open. The Food System Summit called by the UNSG in September 2021 is an opportunity to draw lessons from innovative governance arrangements put in place around the world and to engage relevant actors around priority actions for transforming food systems for the benefit of both people and the planet. And let me finish by saying that it's central that when we talk about building back better or building back better greener, we need to take into account rural areas because that's where most of the poor people are. And if we talk about rural areas, food agriculture, the agri-food systems are central. And if we don't use these scarce resources and invest properly in priority sectors so that we can recover substantially and sustainable in the future, we won't be able to move out of this pandemic in the short term. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chirero. I'm now turning to Ms. Asako Kai, uh, Director of the Crisis Bureau of UNDP. Mr. Kai, while the pandemic has exposed uh, and exacerbated structural inequalities, vulnerabilities, and weak governance capacity everywhere, uh, its impact has perhaps been most severe in crisis-affected countries. So I'd like to ask you, what are the particular challenges of building resilience in fragile situations, and how can they be addressed as we seek to recover and rebuild from COVID-19? Thank you, Director General, for pertinent question. And then uh, we thank uh, the uh, co-organizers of the conference, Italy, you and Dessa, ideal all for bringing us together for such a timely discussion. Um, we know that COVID-19 led to a decline in human development uh, for the first time in the three decades. And the poorest and most marginalized populations are the hardest hit by the pandemic, especially in crisis settings. And over the last year, UNDP worked with partners to support 121 countries to finalize COVID-19 social economic response plans. And I wish to share some reflections from our experiences, particularly as it relates to SDG 16 and building resilience in fragile situations. First, we need to recognize the multi-dimensional nature of development challenges, which cannot be addressed in a siloed way. In practice, this means our work must be informed by robust analysis of risk and understanding of the root causes of systematic inequalities. We see the pandemic compounded pre-existing vulnerabilities and exposed asymmetries and weaknesses in social, uh, political, and economic systems, Food insecurity, just heard, is on the rise, as is displacement. Social cohesion is stretched thin uh, during the pandemic, and political violence and all types of social protest increased uh, substantially. Mismanagement and corruption, for example, which impede delivery of services, can also be a driver of instability and protest, especially when trust in public institution is low. Second, Inclusion and meaningful participation, which lie at the heart of SDG 16, prove to be central and the precondition to achieving equitable outcomes during the pandemic and then build forward better from that. 
uh, disproportionate, uh, disproportionate gender implication of the crisis became so evident. Uh, we heard about the gen uh, gender-based violence, widening inequalities in terms of job loss, access to education, connectivities, and so forth. Nevertheless, the recently launched COVID-19 gender response tracker shows significant gaps in women's participation in decision-making related to COVID-19 policies. We need to redouble the effort to promote the representation of women in public institutions and more gender sensitive policy making. In addition, supporting young people as positive agents of change is critical. I am delighted that the young leaders from the 16 by 16 initiative supported by the government of Italy are speaking at this very session. Uh, Lynn Rose from Philippines, uh, good to see you again. Third, uh, in the face of eroding trust in government institutions, a new social contract based on human rights and equal opportunities for all is needed. I know that dedicated session will be uh, they are conducted in the social contract, uh, uh, but I would like to, to uh, 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 say at this point that uh, we remain concerned that the emergency regulations put in place during COVID-19 may lead to longer term restrictions on human rights and civic space and undermine the rule of law. This is particularly concerned in crisis context. Fourth, addressing the rise of information pollution across the globe is fundamental, not only to preventing the negative health consequences of COVID-19 uh, misinformation, but also to preventing polarization, intolerance, and hate speeches. In fragile and crisis contexts in particular, misinformation and disinformation can result in loss of livelihood, even lives, as well as a political tension and conflict. Fifth, to enhance the resilience to shocks and crisis, we need to invest more in capacitating responsive, accountable institutions. Within UNDP, we are working toward fostering policy and programmatic coherence between resilience and interconnected areas like governance, peace building, prevention, social protection, disaster risk reduction, and risk informed development. What should be at the heart of recovery and rebuilding forward better from COVID-19 is strengthening inclusive governance systems and dynamics to be able to address people's grievances and ensure meaningful representation and participation in decision-making processes at national and local level. Strengthening local capacities and dialogue mechanism can promote a culture of prevention, social cohesion, and behavioral changes. Helping local authorities in provision of basic services, community security, legal services, or the strengthening of national human rights institutions, justice system, social safety net will be foundation of resilient communities. Six, the pandemic further emphasized the need for data and evidence-based policy making. SDG 16 is an area where there is a significant data gap. In a crisis such as this one, Data on satisfaction with public services can be critical for developing more nuanced policies. Significant investment is needed in improving the availability of high quality, reliable and timely data and disaggregated data to better understand who is being left behind. As custodian of several of the indicators on SDG 16, UNDP works uh, with other partners across the UN system to help overcome the data gap on SDG 16. We are working with UNODC and OHCHR to support eight countries in piloting an SDG 16 survey, which measures governance, discrimination, access to justice, violence, corruption, and human trafficking. Finally, on the importance of partnerships, we need agile integrated solution at scale with sustainable impact to further people toward prevention and building resilience. We need to harness new technologies, data and digitalization. For that, we must forge both uh, traditional and new partnership to overcome challenges, harness the respective strengths of different actors from grassroots community actors to national government 
peace builders, justice actors, as well as donor countries and private sector, homegrown innovators to ensure greater efficiency and more tailored responses to crisis. In this regard, we are pleased to launch this week the Thousand Voice Initiative to take stock of emerging trends that uh, facilitate or hinder the achievement of SDG 16 in the context of COVID-19. In closing, I would like to stress the urgency of the challenge at hand. We have less than nine years until 2030. In this decade of action, increased political and financial investment in SDG 16 are essential for a speedy and equitable uh, pandemic recovery. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Over back Thank you later. very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Okai. And now it's a pleasure uh, to introduce Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, a Special Rapporteur of the United Nations Human Rights Council and the General Assembly on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers. Uh, Diego, you've explored in depth the impact of the pandemic on the justice sector, and you are about to publish a report on the subject. How can the legal profession contribute to building resilience to shocks like COVID-19 and to enable more effective responses to future crises? Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, uh, Jan. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, participate in this uh, event today. And thank you for, for your question. Th there will be many aspects to mention, but in, in the benefit of time, I will mention before what uh, can, could be do some major challenges that uh, the pandemic has generated. First, uh, I will mention three. Uh, first, additional problems with access to justice. Before the pandemic, the world had not less than one billion and a half persons without access to justice, combining what happens in different parts of the world. With the pandemic, uh, with the lockdowns, with the difficulties to have access to uh, 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 judicial buildings and to lawyers, uh, this problem has uh, dramatically, dramatically increased. What has been the response that in several countries has been used so to facilitate access from citizens or from lawyers uh, has been mainly information technology, computers, internet, which uh, in a way may sound uh, magic to facilitate access, to make it uh, less expensive, um, to participate on time without uh, people leaving, uh, arriving late to, to certain hearings, but with several problems among uh, which two are uh, specifically uh, relevant. First, first uh, a matter that has been already mentioned, the digital gap, the digital divide, access to, in, for, to internet in several countries of the world, especially in rural areas, even for lawyers, is very difficult or absolutely inaccessible. So there is a major problem in which is question not only of uh, investments, private or public that be made, but especially access to the technology that will facilitate a free or cheap access to this internet and, uh, and, and, and to the uh, uh, high technology for, for having this access. But a second aspect has to do specifically with justice, because many of the um, procedures, technological procedures have, that has been used in the last months worldwide, uh, Zoom and others, uh, do not work properly for judicial processes, for instance, so to guarantee a confidential communication between the lawyer and his or her client. Uh, so that due process uh, having to do with a, a dialogue with a witness that has uh, seen or has participated in a, in a process or who to has, has to recognize a material object is not a difficult, an easy thing to do with this information technology. So many things have to be done regarding to a proper response in a technology that has very quickly been uh, begin to use in several justice systems but has, uh, has come to stay. A second aspect that uh, has uh, uh, very dramatically been uh, suffered in several countries of the world is the uh, increase of uh, gender-based violence 
in the context of lockdowns or quarantines. Uh, the figure that as a, as a special rapporteur at this stage I have is that in the, the standard, the, the, uh, the increase of this gender-based violence has been of approximately 40% for all, which of course generates an immediate uh, need and challenge of response to the judicial system for lawyers in context in which the procedures being used and the responses has not, have not been uh, properly and on time, recognizing that in several countries, important efforts to follow up and to respond to this challenge have been, uh, have been made. Uh, and third, the independence and the functioning of uh, the justice and of the legal profession, in which in the context of lockdowns, in the context uh, of quarantines, it has suffered uh, worldwide, but especially when certain kind of investigations uh, in countries in Africa or in Latin America uh, of corruption connected to the extraordinary resources uh, that have been allocated uh, to combat uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, so the, the corruption generated in this context has not always had the appropriate institutional response and the possibility that the lawyers and uh, follow up, following up these cases can participate properly because all these uh, difficult conditions. So uh, to finalize, I would uh, only summarize in some recommendations that a special rapporteur is uh, trying to disseminate and, and share. I will uh, reduce that to, to six uh, concrete and precise recommendations. First, that the state is responsible for guaranteeing in all contexts, in, in, in including the uh, context of the pandemic, access to justice. Second, administration of justice should be considered an essential public service and its personnel and the role of lawyers, among them an essential, an essential in pandemic context. Third, the suspension of judicial activity should be subject to a strict scrutiny as it is a fundamental pillar in the protection of human rights. Fourth, states should adopt the necessary measures to prioritize attention to criminal situations that have increased exponentially during the pandemic. Fifth, countries should adopt urgent and sustained measures to close the digital divide, the digital gap, with mid and long run objectives in which all uh, the society should participate. And sixth, and for in this, lawyers may play, a, a, should play a very critical role. Technological means for the provision of justice services must ensure for privacy, confidentiality, and security of the information transmitted in all uh, international recognized uh, uh, rule of law uh, standards of uh, due process. So that this in, in information technology doesn't affect uh, human rights, but uh, strengthens and solidifies it. So in this context, many of these challenges, many of these responses that have been designed for the short-term uh, solution, many of them of these should be and will be uh, institutionalized in the mid-term and in, in the mid-run and in the long run. So it's a, a question of major uh, uh, public policies that will continue to be discussed in the UN. And I appreciate the possibility, Jan, to participate in this meeting and all the a, a fantastic presentations that we have uh, heard today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to reading your full report. Uh, our final panelist is Ms. Lynn Rose Genon of the Executive Council of Young Women Plus for Peace and Leadership in the Philippines. And she is also a member of the 16 by 16 initiative of youth-led organizations supporting SDG 16. And first, I'd like to thank you for staying up so late uh, to join us. Oh, it's very late there in the Philippines. So Ms. Jenner, your organization has been working to build a network of young people in the conflict-affected Mindanao region to help create a culture of peace. What actions can we take now to promote a more peaceful, just, and sustainable future and how can we best channel the energy and innovative drive of young leaders around the world into achieving this shared objective? Over to you. 
Thank you very much, Director General. And thank you. It's my pleasure to represent a network of young women leaders and allies for peace in the Philippines under the Young Women Leaders for Peace program of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders and the 16 by 16 initiative, as mentioned by the Director General and Ms. Asako Kai earlier. I'm happy to be part of this conversation. So I think my presentation um, in this conversation, uh, some of the points is a rejoinder of what has been mentioned, but I will draw basically on our experiences um, engaging with, with uh, local young actors, uh, peace builders uh, in the local communities. I remember in 2018, I was invited to talk in an almost similar panel uh, on sustaining peace. And I remember stressing the need for stronger collaboration and intergenerational dialogue between the young ones and the young ones to attain sustainability of the peace movement. I appealed for support to enable young people to lead and implement their own projects, as well as continued mentorship and support for the meaningful inclusion of young women in peace building and sustaining peace. I think that call for greater inclusivity in 2018 for sustainable peace remains in the local, national, and global level. With the challenges we are facing with COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the cost of exclusion and invisibilization of the marginalized sectors. When I talk about the call for greater inclusivity, I think, you know, first is it's recognizing that access to education is fundamental for facilitating young people's positive engagement in peace. And in the context of COVID, and this has been mentioned in several presentations, one of the barriers of inclusion is the digital divide or the digital gap. And we're not talking about lack of access to internet and stable signals here. In many communities in the Philippines, it's lack of access to gadgets. College students or students, for instance, doing flexible learning or a combination of online and offline programs scramble to acquire digital devices and stable signal and internet connection. In the Philippines, it is impossible for parents or guardians, especially those who are among the 27 million Filipinos who, lo who lost their jobs due to the COVID-related economic slowdown to provide for, for such needs. And working in the education sector myself, beyond meeting the immediate needs, we are also confronted with the need to rethink education, scale up distance learning, and make education systems more resilient, open, and innovative. And we can't do it alone. alone. We need reliable ICT infrastructure to be able to do that at the least. The problem of digital divide, I think, must be addressed squarely. And in the Philippines, despite the high internet penetration, many people in rural areas and in poor households, conflict affected areas do not have access to computers, internet, and also there's a significant lack of computer, computer literacy. Therefore, efforts to improve services delivery through online platforms are promising and I think very important, but these entail a rather holistic approach of ICT infrastructure development, clear and implementable policy for integration, and improvement of basic and computer literacy of young people, especially the marginalized sectors. I highly stress this because I think that if this is not addressed, we are increasing the already compounding vulnerabilities of the youth. For instance, in the Philippines during the lockdown, there has been increased number of violence and exploitation of young women and girls with subsequent increase of teenage pregnancies, early marriages and sexual exploitation. And when I say this, I remember one uh, member of our network in Maguindanao, Philippines, and during the COVID uh, um, lockdown, she implemented, she and her team implemented a project educating young women aged 15 to 30 on reproductive health in response to the increasing number of teenage pregnancies in their community during the lockdown. So I think also um, in our network, we've um, done um, initiatives in ensuring access to information to communities, especially those with no internet access, both in conflict and post-conflict areas, by distributing translated COVID-19 materials to local languages, um, together with the dignity kits and, and um, relief operations that we conducted. And I think second, when we talk about greater inclusivity, I think um, it includes recognizing, addressing the need to provide access to safe platform for young women and allies to speak up, volunteer, and contribute. And last year, our network spearheaded COVID-19 emergency response projects that benefited a total number of 716 individuals and 10 families across the Philippines. And our interventions include psychosocial activities, distribution of hygiene and safety kits, educational kits, and what we called healing packages. The interventions were coupled with awareness campaign and COVID-19 prevention. 
We also hosted community youth peace building dialogues and they come from um, Mindanao. And I think this is very, very important um, with the transition of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao and also the upcoming 2022 national elections um, of our country. So we continue that conversation on top of the increasing concerns and problems that we're experiencing with COVID-19. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about greater um, inclusivity, the third point that I would like to stress in this conversation is that um, the need to empower and capacitate more young people through investing in meaningful participation of youth as leaders and peace builders. And that means allocating resources to initiatives in peace building, prevention of violent extremism, and sustaining peace that are led by youth, including young women. And fourth, I think when we talk about call for greater inclusivity, it's recognizing that to be able to harness the power of technology, and this has also been mentioned in the conversation repeatedly, you know, um, in harnessing the power of technology and addressing global crises such as COVID and climate change, I think we need to partner and support economic empowerment initiatives by le led by young people and support youth innovation. And this can be done um, through building partnerships with mobile and technological companies to build projects together with youth partners to help young entrepreneurs to scale up their inventions. And I think when I talk about partnership here, I am referring to inclusive, intentional, mutually respectful partnership between youth and adults where power is shared. And in the face of crisis, we have also seen that democracies are under attack. In my home country, for instance, young people organizing and addressing the lack of response and inefficiency of the government are being harassed both online and offline by state forces. We have seen the importance of strong local civil society and youth-led networks that can hold governments accountable. And I think my fifth point, when we talk about call for greater inclusivity, I think it's the need to address um, this and to put more young people in leadership roles. We need to support and create an enabling environment for more young people to take on leadership roles. I think it is crucial that governments make sustained commitments to rebuild young people's trust and confidence in governments. With the lack of effective and efficient government response to the pandemic, we have seen young people in the front lines. In our network, we have young women leaders at the front lines, ensuring the family that family-centered and gender-sensitive relief operations reach local communities. The leadership of young people needs to be recognized, needs to be invested in, and needs to be amplified. The COVID crisis has even more emphasized the need for a decisive lead leadership, effective orchestration of state powers, evidence-based decision-making, transparency, and cooperation and buy-in, and health system planning and preparedness. And the lack of any of those has cost lives, and I think too many lives. So for me, um, through the things that I've mentioned and through the work of our network, we aim to remind each and every one of us the women, young women, and allies' meaningful participation are important in sustaining peace and security, not just in our country, but around the world. Thank you so much for the space and time, and I'll hand it over back to the Director General. Thank you so much, Ms. Jenna. We've received a, a number of, of questions uh, from participants, and I'm going to give the floor just to a small number of participants to um, give us their questions, and then I'll turn back to the, to the panel for a last word um, from each of you um, to, to those questions. Uh, so the first uh, participant is, uh, Mr. Habib Maher, he's the Deputy Secretary General of the G7 Plus Secretariat from Afghanistan. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Director General, um, for the opportunity. Um, as you said, my name is Habib Maher. Um, I'm the Deputy General Secretary of uh, the G7 Plus Secretariat. Uh, G7 Plus is an intergovernmental organization of uh, 20 conflict-affected, fragile countries that promote new approach to peace and state building, uh, founded on the country's context and the aspiration of uh, their people. Uh, the G7 Plus was among the core advocates of the SDG 16, uh, given its relevance to our context. Uh, conflict-affected countries are disproportionately affected by the direct and indirect impact of the pandemic. Uh, which seem to last even longer, uh, given the already fragile institutions, a weak peace and vulnerable economies. Uh, as COVID-19 was declared pandemic, uh, it started overwhelming the already overstretched and under-resourced under health systems. As it has direct impact, the associated countermeasures, reversing the hard-won gains, 
made over decades. Which I encourage participants to visit to see the impact of the COVID 19 on the, on the complex fragile, uh, complex affected and fragile species. Uh, given the fragile sea peaks in complex affected countries, uh, the outbreak of the pandemic is more than a health crisis for us. It has undermined peace, security, and justice, uh, which are the most precious commodity for our people. Despite the global call for a ceasefire, steered by the UN Secretary General. Conflicts in some of our countries did not only continue, but were escalated. This is contrary to our expectation that the outbreak of the pandemic would at least induce solidarity and empathy on part of the insurgents, including terrorists and spoilers. The JSON Plus members also issued a joint statement supporting the call for ceasefire and asking for collective efforts to curb the consequences of the pandemic. remain constant and the pandemic is only set to further exacerbate its prevalence. We witnessed increased violence in Afghanistan, my, my own country, for example. We saw election-related crisis in CAR, Chad, and other countries. Therefore, I would like to ask how we can use the pandemic to raise awareness for addressing conflicts and inducing solidarity. And more importantly, what role can the UN and the international community play in pursuing ceasefire and peace in the world's chronically fragile and conflict affected countries. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, the, next, the next speaker is Mr. Tawanda Hondora. He is the uh, head of the rule of law section in the Commonwealth Secretariat. You have the floor, sir. Uh, Jan, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, many thanks, and for giving me this opportunity. Uh, mine is actually a really short question, uh, which uh, feeds off uh, from the last speaker. Now, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed serious weaknesses in current international cooperation frameworks. Now, this leads me to ask the following question. Since SDG 16 is about peace, justice, and the rule of law, what more do we need to do to build multilateral cooperation frameworks that are effective in ensuring global peace and security, effective rule of law, and that will build confidence in democratic governance? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Fatima Al Halaibi, uh, she's a lawyer from the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development. Thank you, Director General, for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, my question is the UN Secretary General recently. Uh, warned that we are witnessing the worst recession in 90 years and some 120 million people have fallen back into extreme poverty. How can effective, how can effective laws and institutions promote economic development and help in the recovery of, for, from the pandemic? Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I'll take just one more. And this will be Ms. Lubna Zaiban. She is a judge from Bangladesh and a member of the International Association of Women Judges. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, as you uh, introduced me, I'm a judge of Bangladesh and I am uh, a member of International Association of uh, Women Judges and also a member of Bangladesh Women Judges Association. Thank you, the organization, organizers, for giving me the opportunity to ask questions in such an important event. I am indeed benefited by this event where I met many distinguished persons virtually and get important and essential information about SDG 16. SDG 16, it's very important. This event addressed SDG 16 more clearly than anyone could. I have a very uh, uh, small question. As I'm a judge, what I have seen in worldwide, it is found that women have been mostly affected 
with the effects of COVID-19 measures and restrictions. Courts have been closed and essential services restricted. You know, women judges have been a strong voice to protect and uphold women's rights. My question is, what are the actions and measures in this pandemic situation is important to ensure women's interests uh, in this pandemic situation in the judicial system and to ensure the voice of women legal professionals to be heard. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to turn back to the panel. Uh, we've heard uh, four quite different uh, questions, but I think with some common threads um, around the impact, uh, particularly the impact on conflict affected and fragile states around the need to rebuild multilateral frameworks to, to build trust between uh, governments and, and civil society around the disproportionate effect on women and around uh, the role of, of effective laws and institutions in promoting inclusive economic development. So I would um, turn back to the panel and I, I will ask them to address any or all of the questions as they, as they, would, as they would wish. Uh, and I'm going to, to start uh, with uh, Ms. Tete. Anna, please. Thank you very much, Jan. And thank you very much to all of the ladies and um, gentlemen who ask the questions. I think it's important for us to recognize that while we can have effective laws, effective laws require strong institutions to make sure that those laws are enforced. And I think that the challenge across most of the countries where you have seen a shrinking of the space for protection and respect of human rights had challenges with their legal rule of law institutions in the first place. And so one of the things that we have to focus on post pandemic is how we provide through the various funds, agencies, programs that are interested in supporting such initiatives, working with member states to make sure that the emphasis is on strengthening the rule of law and justice institutions, because they are a crucial element in state building. Even when you talk about fragile states, if I take, for example, a country like Somalia, one of the challenges when I, I was discussing with troop contributing representatives of troop contributing countries about two years ago in the fight against Al-Shabaab, and I remember there was one of the generals who said clearly to me, he said, Madam, you know something, we can recover a territory maybe in about two days, but we are not responsible for statecraft. Statecraft is the responsibility of government. And therefore it is necessary for the government to invest and make a commitment towards creating those institutions that are responsive to the needs of the people. And then it comes back to the issue of states and the way in which they impact the multilateral institutions they are part of. Because we have such a wide range of membership within the United Nations and many countries that are committed to the protection of human rights and the rule of law, those of us who work under the auspices of the United Nations are able to insist on certain levels of inclusiveness, integrity, and respect for all of those values, because they are values of the organization that are upheld on a, current, on a continuous basis. At the regional and sub-regional level, we have to insist that our organizations have the same level of commitment. And then finally, I'd like to make, if I may, a short comment on uh, the issues that were raised by our youth panelists. I think that one of the things that new technologies have created is the opportunity for young people's voices to be heard in places where they were not heard previously. And I think that with the space that has been created by these new technologies, I would encourage you to use that space as much as possible because we need to be able to have a voice for change. And I think you are some of the strongest voices in that regard. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm turning now to uh, Ms. Okai. Thank you, Director General, and thank you for our wonderful questions. Uh, they all relate to work on the UNDP, and then I uh, would like to frame it in uh, the um, uh, two front. Uh, one that is about the UN response as a whole in uh, responding to social uh, economic uh, the um, impact. Uh, uh, in addition to the health response led by WHO, um, and then also the humanitarian 
is the uh, intervention led by OCHA. There is the uh, UN framework in response to social economic impact of COVID and UNDP and then the uh, development system uh, is in uh, uh, coordinating uh, multi-agency uh, the uh, platform for that. And, and then for that, there will be uh, the many aspects addressed, including uh, social protection, protecting lives, uh, macroeconomic aspect, uh, how we uh, improve rule of law, justice, uh, social cohesion, uh, all are part of the uh, integrated uh, response. So uh, for this, uh, the, uh, we are happy to uh, say that the, uh, in hundred uh, more than 120 countries, there is also already a response plan uh, on the ground uh, with the whole UN system on board. Uh, so um, uh, there's the, uh, the partnership uh, ready. And then in terms of the uh, social uh, economic side, uh, there is a, a great collaboration already ongoing uh, with the IMF, World Bank, uh, and other the, uh, in, uh, the uh, IFIs. Uh, uh, so um, uh, the, uh, that, uh, through that response, uh, the uh, poverty re uh, reduction and economic front, uh, and then the, uh, that uh, with the um, cross-cutting, uh, the uh, importance of SDG uh, is uh, now uh, being looked at. Um, in terms of the uh, question specifically uh, for the um, uh, the uh, from the Bangladesh uh, judge uh, judge uh, from the Bangladesh uh, on the um, uh, court closures and the actionable measures under the uh, restriction, um, we are actually harnessing uh, e uh, justice system. Uh, e government uh, is a part of uh, our challenge, but the as uh, 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 part. They are doing things remotely. The court is uh, being held uh, uh, with this uh, the um, uh, uh, digital platform uh, and the, that uh, effort uh, there. So um, uh, to, in order to get the uh, more voices heard, that uh, is a part of the uh, inclusive uh, governance that I talked about. Uh, uh, but the, the um, uh, digital, the, definitely we need to make use of it. And then we need to, uh, at the same time, uh, address the uh, digital divide that, yeah, that has been uh, the, uh, raised. Um, uh, on the ceasefire and the peace front, I just would like to, to enhance what the um, Miloslav uh, of the DPPA mentioned. The prevention work uh, uh, from the development side is critically important, addressing grievances uh, the, uh, or the institutional measures for the prevention uh, of the conflict and uh, the, uh, for sustaining peace. Uh, uh, we look forward to working together with all the partners on that front. Uh, but uh, for that, uh, the uh, digital uh, uh, data and evidence-based approach uh, that I talked about will be critical to get the partnership on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, then maybe to make the linkage, uh, uh, Mr. Miroslav, uh, Miroslav Jenchas. Thank you, John. Uh, really very interesting discussion and uh, good questions. So uh, let me, uh, that would be pretty natural, answer the question about the uh, global call for uh, ceasefire from our friend uh, Habib Mayar from Afghanistan. So uh, Secretary General, very early into the uh, pandemic, into the crisis, uh, called uh, for global ceasefire and very understandably so, because uh, uh, the pandemic uh, was uh, not uh, choosing uh, among the parties has been affecting uh, negatively, very negatively everybody. It took uh, Security Council three months to agree on a resolution to support uh, this global call. I mentioned this, to just underline uh, how difficult uh, even such a simple uh, you know, topic uh, uh, can, uh, can be that uh, would be understandable to everybody, but this is uh, a reality. Uh, we think that still uh, the impact of COVID-19 on conflict dynamics uh, has been uh, more limited uh, than uh, initially feared but its long-term consequences could undermine stability even in countries that uh, has been traditionally uh, considered uh, quite uh, stable. 
the impact of uh, this information uh, that uh, has been mentioned here uh, many times uh, has been extremely uh, negative at both the international and uh, national uh, levels. Uh, the pandemic uh, uh, simply has exacerbated uh, it uh, to an unprecedented level and the mass scale disinformation will remain a key challenge for us long after the COVID-19 crisis uh, ends. So uh, the task ahead of us uh, is mending the fractures in the multilateral system while a pandemic rages uh, and geopolitical tensions uh, may remain uh, high. This task is uh, colossal. So we must help our member states uh, rebuild their trust in international cooperation and the role of the United Nations. We need to do this with our partners, uh, civil society, international organizations, uh, you know, governments, uh, and different actors. So to conclude, frankly, I don't think uh, there are any magical solutions, but the hard work that we must undertake uh, to rebuild trust in international institutions. Uh, and uh, in this uh, respect, uh, we need to join uh, our, our forces. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miroslav. Um, turning to Mr. Torero. Thank you very much, Director General. So, let me, let me bring, I think, a concept which is extremely important to understand, which is resilience, which is a pretty complex concept. And normally, when we talk about resilience, we have been focusing about individuals and households. But in the concept of the food systems, uh, resilience becomes a little bit more difficult uh, to, to analyze. Because it's not only about capacity of food systems to absorb a shock and recognize to resume functioning, but it's also anticipating and preventing or adapting to a particular shock with the aim to ensure sufficient, safe, and nutritious food available for all. And understand this in the context, for example, of conflict, as it, as it was mentioned, is extremely complex to be able to be predictive and extremely complex to be able to respond to it so that you can cope better with the consequences of, of the actions that are happening. So we need to bring a combination of package of national policies, laws, programs, and it's essential to ensure that the food systems, uh, the agri-food systems are resilient, but the adoption of good policies uh, will be insufficient. In many countries, relevant laws and policies were modeled on those in other countries and have not been adapted to reflect the local culture, practices, and resources. So we need to understand uh, the context in which we are working, and we need to understand how we can increase this level of resilience. For example, we know that key drivers of food insecurity are conflict, uh, climate, uh, slowdowns and downturns like the ones we are living today because of COVID-19 and of course pandemics, no? which creates the consequences of the slowdowns and downturns. But that's where we need to, to act. And, and the biggest threat to food security and nutrition during this pandemic has not come from disruptions to the food availability because we have seen that the rural sector and the agricultural sector has been very resilient. If you just look at trade, and the level of the import bill and exports, it has not changed too much. But the major problem comes from the side of the consumers and is deeper in areas which were already vulnerable uh, and in sectors which were vulnerable. So it's basically exacerbating uh, the, the inequalities. Uh, so access to food in urban, peri-urban areas in zones of conflicts, in zones which have been affected by shocks, like what happened in Central America, what is happening in some Caribbean islands today, is where we need to react. And that's the, the second element of this resilience, which I think is central, uh, is how to cope, because it will be very difficult in these extreme situations to really have some predictive power in early warning systems. We, we are working on that, but it's sometimes extremely complex. But how we help them to cope, and that's where social protection policies uh, and programs can help to vulnerable populations to avoid food insecurity and malnutrition, but only if those policies and programs are able to identify those most in need and ensure delivery to the most vulnerable and affected. And here comes back to a priority of data, and especially real-time data, which is guided by science and based rules protocols, which is essential to assure how to target this type of interventions. So again, the food systems are complex. And cross-sectional coordination among most of the sectors. When competent actors on different levels work well together,
together, they are, they are enable coordinated actions in the face of change and provide flexibility to deal with issues on the appropriate level. And that's why the coordination among the UN agencies and all our partners is, is central because it's difficult to find this level of coherence that because we it's difficult to find this level of coherence that, that, show us that if we don't if we are not coherent and we don't work together gaining complementarities and minimizing trade-offs we will be facing significant challenges and finally to be truly effective the laws policies and institutions must be perceived, must be perceived as by key stakeholders the human element is essential key stakeholders, stakeholders to be involved in decision making Government actors, as well as private sector, agricultural producers, processors, consumers, traditional leaders, producer organizations, women associations. The effectiveness of relevant laws and policies, and especially existing institutional capacities, human capital, and engagement of key stakeholders prove crucial for shaping food systems responses to COVID-19 by enabling preventing coordinated action among concerned organizations and actors across the food agri-food system timely and appropriate information and communication. We have significant complexities in having the resources needed to collect the timely information needed. And finally, accountability for of the implementation of response measures, targeting those most affected and delivering necessary public services. Thank you very much, Director General. Thank you very much, Mr. Guerrero. Uh, I'm now turning to Mr. Garcia Sayan. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, John. And, and I would like to, to, to respond to the very useful comment made by Lubna Sahan, the judge from, from Bangladesh, which is a very relevant matter in a, in a context in which worldwide uh, women have uh, especially and severely uh, been attacked and suffered in the context of uh, the quarantines and, and lockdowns. I, I wish that uh, three uh, systematic and strategic actions it could be consistently uh, performed in some countries. There is things like this have been uh, have been done. Argentina, among others. Uh, first, uh, consider that uh, it is absolutely essential to disseminate appropriate information. So, how can victims can contact uh, somebody in the judicial system, in the in the, in the in public prosecutors, uh, so that their their uh, problem. Can be can be known. Second, uh, uh, improve and guarantee ways and means of how to access uh, to put in contact to put these victims in contact with institutions in in a context in which most people are, are being deprived of uh, the appropriate technological means, but perhaps some way through telephones, some way through uh, neighbors associations and ways through which uh, discreetly. Uh, so not be so not to suffer a, a reaction from the the perpetrator of the aggression so to have a, a special uh, a connection with the uh, institutions that can be in, 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 in performing this kind of activity second uh, to guarantee that the all institutions that are performing free legal aid services are not continue to be affected one of the areas worldwide in which uh, the, the function of lawyers has been especially affected is the free legal aid services, which is, has not been considered an essential services in most countries. This is a very important matter in which at least considering violence against uh, women, gender violence should be absolutely guaranteed uh, by, by, by the state. So I am not with this imagining magic uh, solutions but essential uh, aspects that should be uh, stressed by international organizations. So to increase the awareness and the priority that the states should give to this as a major global problem that is not only an exceptional thing that may have been occurring in some countries of the world. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ms. Jenam, over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, I think I would uh, respond to, to the question and comment on 
especially working with um, in conflict and post-conflict areas. Uh, I think uh, I've stressed um, in, in my presentation about um, greater call for inclusivity. And I think one important component of that is also protection. And protection is crucial in ensuring that young people are, become meaningful partners. And I think uh, this calls for strong mechanisms of human rights protection for young peace builders. And in the Philippines, uh, they're lacks a strong human rights uh, protection mechanism of young peace builders against state intimidation and red tagging. And I think um, strong mechanism of human rights protection is a requisite to continue the work that we do. And also um, to add uh, to Ms. Hannah's um, the comment earlier, yes, the, the online platform has given uh, young people more opportunities so that their voice will be heard. But I think also it is a platform for um, to, to, you know, like uh, gather um, uh, uh, build solidarity um, of youth-led networks and um, to create, you know, the, the power, to tap on the power of collective voice. And I think, um, and when we talk about online platform as well, we also need to, to tie it in with, with, with the idea of protection in digital spaces. And, and uh, because that has also been a space where, 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 where um, state forces uh, actually like um, intentionally um, exclude um, young peace builders and young, young actors. And, but, but I would like to, to um, emphasize the power um, of solidarity of um, youth-led networks, both formal and informal networks. And I think um, my last comment is on, um, I think we need um, international organizations to provide more accessible funding and resources um, to, to local, uh, uh, to grassroots of, of, uh, actors and invest in local actors and strengthening local capacities and especially, you know, local um, young peace builders. And I think uh, those are my three quick comments to all the questions raised in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn Rose. Well, I think it's been an extremely rich uh, discussion and I want to thank all of you for your, for your participation. I think we can see many, many common threads. I think we all agree that the pandemic has profoundly changed our world and, and exacerbated inequalities everywhere um, of, of all kinds, economic and financial, obviously, but also social and human rights and in the areas of, of food security and, and others, but disproportionately in developing countries and disproportionately on women and girls and other vulnerable groups. And I think that um, this uh, has come out very clearly from, from both our sessions uh, today. But I think on, on, the, on the positive side, uh, if you like, we can see a lot of consensus around the way forward and the, the need absolutely uh, to invest uh, in the rule of law, in justice systems, and particularly to address um, issues of accountability, of uh, institutional uh, capacity building, of uh, a free and independent media and combating misinformation, bridging the digital divide, strengthening prevention, I think as is being talked about in, in many contexts, strengthening governance systems, combating corruption, um, looking towards gender sensitive policies, and of course, a very important area of gender based violence, um, issues around data and evidence and, and good information. Um, and all of this is, is essential to build that resilience, that, that complex concept of, of resilience um, that we've been talking about, and to strengthen social cohesion, build more just and inclusive societies, and protect the most vulnerable. And I think an important element that has also run through almost all of the interventions is about the need to rebuild trust, the need for uh, inclusive approaches, so multilateral approaches, multi-sectoral approaches, multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships, uh, both traditional partnerships and new partnerships, as has been said. Um, and, and I think the importance of civil society has been stressed by many, and, and this whole idea of the new social contract I think has, has come through. And maybe uh, the final thought that, that I would leave us with is, is really about supporting and empowering young people. I think that that is, is absolutely essential, that young people are the future, young people are the present. So that young people should be the agents of change. They should be really um, supported, empowered. And uh, there, there are many elements to this, but I would uh, mention the last one that Lynn Rose uh, spoke about, uh, more accessible funding. I think this is absolutely a key. And I might say that it's key um, throughout um, the, the whole area of, 
for the rule of law and access to justice. This is not an area that is um, well funded either in uh, development assistance or in most national budgets. So I think uh, this is an area that we hope um, will be given more attention uh, as we move forward. So I'd like to thank all of you, all of the panelists and all of the participants who have been uh, uh, on uh, this journey with us. I hope you will stay on for today's three parallel sessions that will explore uh, the pandemic's impact on progress towards goal 16 in greater detail. And also, I hope you'll join us tomorrow um, as we look at the implications of the pandemic uh, on the relationship between citizens and states and how to rebuild trust between people and governments through SDG 16. So for now, thank you all very much and goodbye.